Thank you all so much for coming. It gives me a uh, great pleasure to introduce Dr. Laura D. Baker, our uh, grand round speaker today. Dr. Baker is a professor of internal medicine, neurology, and public health sciences at Wake Forest School of Medicine and associate director of the NIA supported Wake Forest Alzheimer's Disease Research Center in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. And Dr. Baker is an international leader in the areas of cognitive aging and lifestyle interventions to protect brain health and prevent cognitive decline, Alzheimer's disease, and other dementias. Dr. Baker, thank you so much for, for joining us today. Well, thank you. And um, I appreciate, always love the opportunity to speak to public health. Uh, so it's just the older I get, the more I care more specifically about public health and not conducting um, research behind the walls of hospitals necessarily. So um, I'm very grateful to be here today. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, start sharing my screen, um, and then we'll get started. So uh, my job today is to tell you about the results of a recent trial that we've uh, completed. Um, hang on, let me get rid of these. Okay, recent trial that we've uh, completed uh, having to do with uh, cocoa extract uh, that in contains cocoa flavanols and daily multivitamins in, a, in more of a pragmatic style, uh, randomized controlled trial. Okay, hang on, We're learning how to drive here. Okay, uh, our, our funding for this, that our, our, the study I'm gonna talk to you about today, Cosmos Mind uh, was uh, funded by an R01. The, uh, we are an ancillary study to a large parent trial and the parent trial was funded uh, by Mars Edge uh, that provided some donation of study pills and packaging, some Pfizer consumer healthcare that provided uh, some of the study pills, the multivitamin pills and packaging, and also by uh, a number of NIH grants. I think I just want to state at this point that Mars Edge and Fi neither Mars Edge nor Pfizer participated in the development of the study design, the conduct of the trial, data analysis, prep uh, or, or preparation of the manuscript uh, that was uh, just accepted for publication. So before we dive into background, I thought I'd give you some back, uh, some a little background context of how what we're doing here in this study. Uh, the parent trial I mentioned a moment ago was uh, a large two by two factorial, uh, pragmatic style randomized control trial of cocoa testing whether cocoa extract uh, that include cocoa flavanols and a multivitamin mineral, uh, Centrum Silver. Could it, uh, what, what kind of effects did it have on cardiovascular and cancer endpoints? The intervention was uh, approximately three years long. Uh, it was a large study that en enrolled over 21,000 individuals recruited primarily through national mailings and exclusions for MI and stroke. So this is a large parent, two by two. Was a, it, what we liked about it was a nice efficient trial to basically test two different agents uh, efficiently within one trial. Well, there was no, the parent trial never expected interactions uh, on uh, of the cocoa flavanols and the multivitamin on their endpoints, cardiovascular and cancer endpoints. Um, and we just thought this was a nice uh, model to test uh, cognition, add cognition to this large ongoing trial. So I'll tell you more about that in a minute, but I just wanted to give you that context to kind of understand why we're talking both about cocoa flavanols and multivitamins. So first, let's let's talk about cocoa flavanols first uh, and cognition. Um, and so this, you know, this study was um, the uh, our study, Cosmos Mind. Well, we were excited about this possibility of latching on to this parent trial because there has been evidence uh, in the past for some cognitive benefit of regular use of cocoa flavanols, um, either as a supplement or in diet uh, for older adults. And this comes from epidemiologic studies and a few small short duration controlled trials. So it really hadn't been much work, but there seemed to be some promise. Uh, in particular, uh, especially with the, the groups that we care about, the older adults, um, there was some signal of for memory improvements in memory and executive function, uh, especially with the higher amounts of cocoa flavanols, and that's on the order of seven, 500 to 750 mg, uh, milligrams per day. And 
you know, what was interesting for me, I study cognitive decline and prevention of Alzheimer's disease. So I was particularly excited about the potential benefits of short-term uh, use for adults with mild cognitive impairments. It's a very small study, but still uh, makes it made it worth it for me to go ahead and invest um, in, in getting trying to get some funding there. So what about the, the other arm, the other two uh, arms of the two by two factorial multivitamin? You know, what, why, why, what would be our motivation for uh, putting in for a grant to, to look at this as an ancillary study? Well, I mean, it's common knowledge. We all know that there are essential micronutrients that we need for, you know, to support multiple biologic pathways, uh, particularly for brain health. Uh, it, as, it, as it relates to our, our interest. And we, there is some evidence to suggest that some uh, deficiencies in these micronutrients and minerals may increase the risk for cognitive decline and dementia. But, we, and, but so far we don't really have any consistent evidence uh, to suggest that the in daily use of individual supplements, uh, nutri nutrient supplements could uh, support uh, cognition. You know, there's some, there's some good work, uh, nice work, um, all I would say preliminary still looking at vitamin B in particular. Um, but the results of meta-analyses uh, fail to, to fail to indicate that, that this this evidence is strong enough to uh, encourage uh, standard recommendation uh, for uh, to benefit cognitive health in older adults. Um, and so far, any all meta-analyses uh, are showing only weak evidence uh, for benefit. So. Uh, a few years ago, uh, several years ago, I guess this study, the Physicians Health Study, was published, and so this is the the main. This is the only study before Cosmos Mind that could really speak to whether you know daily multivitamin supplementation could be beneficial for brain health. Uh, so in this study, this was the Physicians Health Study two in particular, and it was a, a an ancillary study, a cognitive uh, uh, that added cognitive endpoints to the Physicians Health Study. Um, it was all in older uh, male physicians. Uh, the cognitive, the first cognitive assessment in the physician's health study began two and a half years after randomization. So really, they didn't have a baseline assessment uh, in this study of cognition. Um, what I have on the right here is just uh, some examples of the, the participant profile. Uh, these are these men, as you might expect, were all in uh, excellent to very good health. Uh, they are uh, very few smokers, they exercise, they get, they sleep well, they don't eat fast food, and I like this one, did they wear sunscreen during the past summer? I think it's a, you know, it's a, it's a finger on the pulse uh, for other health uh, behaviors, um, and so it's just kind of interesting, but I think it makes the point that uh, this is a highly, uh, this is a select group, um, and, you know, not quite sure uh, what, you know, what, what, these results suggest. I mean, there was no cognitive benefit reported, but I think because of this uh, unique characteristics of the cohort, uh, it, for us, it left many questions still unanswered, and we felt like it was important for us to study this in a more community-based cohort that included women uh, of, uh, with more, relatively more diversity. So our aims for Cosmos Mind uh, were to test, number one, we wanted to see whether daily supplementation with cocoa extract uh, versus placebo, Matt's placebo, uh, what effects it had on a global cognitive function composite score. And our secondary endpoint was to test whether daily supplementation with a multivitamin multimineral, that's the Centrum Silver uh, versus placebo, uh, did it benefit global cognitive function. Our other aims, we looked at the treatment effects of cocoa extract and multivitamin on executive function and memory in, in terms of composite scores, so you know, specific domains, uh, whether it affected these specific domains. And we also were interested in looking at treatment effects on uh, specific subgroups that were, what we, or were known to be more vulnerable to cognitive decline. Uh, so based on age, so older adults, sex, uh, baseline cognitive status, those who perform lower at baseline are at higher risk, those with depression, diabetes, and cardiovascular disease history. Um, and then we have some ongoing work. We're still looking at the effects of these two interventions on incident mild cognitive impairment and Alzheimer's disease and related dementias. 
So here's the study design again, just to remind you, it's a two by two factorial, simple, pragmatic. This is the parent trial, uh, cocoa extract versus multi and multivitamin mineral. So all four, all possible combinations. I'll show you those in a minute. Uh, they were looking at cardiovascular and cancer endpoints, and they uh, recruited primarily through national mailing. So it was a much more diverse than the physician's health study, um, but you know, still it's those who respond to these kinds of mailings. And they had quite a large uh, cohort uh, in their study. So we were the add-on. Um, we, uh, we wanted to reduce, uh, we, we were looking for people who are at higher risk of decline or higher risk of cognitive impairment. So we restricted our age to uh, 65 and older only. So we excluded a little bit younger folks that the parent trial included. Uh, a self-reported dementia diagnosis was an exclusion and insulin use for type two diabetes was excluded. Uh, we uh, enrolled roughly 10% 10, uh, 10 of, the, of the larger cohort. So we had 2,262. And our cognitive assessments and baseline, uh, cognitive assessments were conducted at baseline and annually uh, for three years. I think what was, remember this is a pragmatic trial uh, and all the parent trials all done by mail predominantly. So our, our cognitive assessments were done uh, by telephone. Um, and I'll tell you more about that in just a minute, but I just wanted to show you that this, the complexity of this study. So the, we, there were multiple uh, ancillary studies. Uh, ours was uh, this one here with 2262. There's Cosmos Web is another uh, cognitive ancillary study where all it's, uh, it's, uh, uh, was done by Scott Small and Adam Brickman out of Columbia. It's all computer-based assessments. So it's, you had to log on and complete some uh, testing online. Um, no, in, no phone, tel no telephone, no other testing. Um, and we do have some overlap there uh, between the two studies. So we haven't started looking, we haven't looked at that yet, but we uh, certainly plan to do that. Then there were some in-clinic assessments, cognitive assessments. Uh, those, those folks are still looking at their data. They haven't finished analyzing. And now, and then we have blood in about 7,000 people. And unfortunately, our overlap with us was only about 150 people with blood in our study. So We've got more work to do there. So that kind of gives you some context. Our cognitive assessments are, were all by telephone, given the pragmatic style of, of the study. Uh, we, we really wanted to assess uh, a global cognition. How, does the, how do these two supplements, is there change in, a, in some global measure? So, and then we also wanted to look at, you know, into, um, specific measures. So is it affecting executive function more or memory more? So we, we our test, we, we administered several different tests. These tests over the phone took about 45 minutes. Um, this is based on work that we've done at Wake Forest for years in the Women's Health Initiative. So we know it works. We know we could get good, reliable data from these women uh, and men. Um, we, know, uh, we know how to train our examiners. We know how to monitor and audit to make sure we get rid really good quality data. So this really felt like a really good match too with the parent trials that, because of our expertise and in, in our ability to do this. So we looked at uh, so our cognitive tests are general, kind of a screening measure it's a, a, used in a lot of stu studies. We have memory tests, what word recalls and a story recall. And then we have executive function. It has to be a trail making test that's presented orally, of course. We have some fluency tasks, some uh, short-term working memory kinds of things, number span and digit order ordering. And we combined all of these to create this global cognitive function. And then the memory composite was made up of subsets of these tests. So uh, when it's time to look at the data, this is what we did. Uh, we used uh, intention to treat. Um, our analytic model was such that we kept, we uh, treated time as a categorical variable. We used mixed effects model uh, to fit cognitive data from all participants at all time points uh, in, in the spirit of intention to treat. We used linear contrast to estimate and compare differences from baseline to the mean of all three follow-up time points by treatment group. So we looked at baseline versus the mean of year one, two, and three. So we wanted a, a composite treatment effect uh, compared to baseline. So that's how we uh, a priori decided to uh, analyze these data. So primary aim, we looked at cocoa extract versus placebo. 
the, the matched placebo cocoa extract. Uh, the secondary, we looked at multivitamin versus the matched placebo. And then we looked at the interaction, of course. So we assume no interaction, but we, of course, need to test to make sure that that was true. So inter interaction be cocoa extract by multivitamin. And then here's our pre-specified subgroups analyses um, that we uh, examining treatment, uh, specific treatment uh, response uh, by particular subgroups. And then, of course, we used multiple imputation for to look at missing data. So here's our consort, uh, busy, uh, but that's what you see is our, uh, our randomization here. We start off with over 5,000 people that we approach from the parent trial. So we recruited only from that trial. Um, we were, our cohort was, uh, our, our largely looked, uh, the demographics were very similar. However, we prioritized uh, certain characteristics um, such as uh, uh, race, ethnicity, older age, and lower education. So we did a little bit better than the parent trial in getting a little increased diversity in our group. Uh, here's the four possible combinations uh, here at the top. Um, we're all, and remember though that in this two by two, we did not expect any uh, interactions. So uh, our analysis plan were combined two groups at a time. Um, and then our finished product here, uh, in terms of uh, completers, we had a good balance across all four possible groups. So we really um, had excellent um, uh, uh, retention. Uh, in year one, we uh, had 90% who stayed in the study. At year two, 84%. Year three, 79%. And we have complete data on 77%. I, I find that I still find that amazing. I think uh, part of this has to do with the telephone administration. Um, and, you know, I think another important point is we continued through the pandemic. Uh, we did not pause our study at all. And actually, we had higher rates of uh, getting folks on the phone uh, during the pandemic. So I think it for, you know, one of the first times uh, I've ever heard of a, a situation like that uh, working in favor of a study. All right. So this is what our folks look like. Um, I'll take off this. Bar, the box is just for a minute. At baseline, uh, this, this overall here in the first column and then the four groups, um, we the groups were all balanced by age, uh, sex. Uh, we're about 60% female overall. Um, never happy with our diversity. Um, we, we, you know, we recruited from this other trial, so we were limited uh, there. We had about 12% uh, uh, from communities of color. Um, and I was, we were really hoping to get closer to 18%, but that just didn't happen. Um, and education uh, was, um, they, our folks were highly educated. We had only about 15% uh, without a college, uh, without, uh, that did not attend college. So we've got some work to do, um, but it does, um, uh, it, 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 it does hurt, affect the generalization. Um, we saw no group differences above, uh, and, and there was no diff group differences by CVD history, diabetes, uh, self-report, diabetes at baseline, no, no group differences by depression, smoking status, alcohol intake, baseline chocolate intake, and prior multivitamin use. So the four groups were uh, well balanced. Here are our baseline test scores by treatment group, cognitive test scores, and the groups were, this is our, our primary analyses, our primary and secondary analyses here summarized, and we really, we did not have uh, any significant uh, bias that we were concerned about uh, number span forward uh, with a number of uh, comparisons uh, that, that really, really did not concern us. So this is what we found uh, in the cocoa extract, uh, looking at the global cognitive composite score. Uh, we see, uh, the, and these are changed from baseline, these are Z-scores. So these are all composite scores are standardized relative to, you know, Z-scores uh, standardized relative to baseline. So we would expect a zero at baseline. And what we see over time, uh, the in placebo group is in the red and the active cocoa extract group is in the blue. And uh, the, so the, uh, treatment years or follow, and treatment and follow up years in one, two, and three, we see this incline uh, increase in the cognitive global cognitive uh, composite score from baseline to year two in both groups. 
this is a, a pattern that we see over and over in, um, in studies where we have cognitive endpoints, where we have repeat testing over time in non-demented individuals. This is, a, 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 this is our best guess here is that this is a practice effect. Um, and that, uh, that and with, at some point there's some leveling out of the practice effect. And this is uh, maybe more the, the, the truth, true fact, true, uh, or, or this is the leveling out of the practice effect. And this is um, just kind of the function that it followed. Uh, but uh, important, I think, for us and, and this presentation is that there was no separation between those groups, uh, whether it's there's no treatment effect or there's no uh, accelerated practice effect, whichever. Um, that there was no difference between the groups. Here's what we saw with the multivitamin uh, and mineral, uh, that we see the same practice effect, but we see a clear separation between the groups where the active group is, uh, uh, is higher, the scores are higher uh, by, by year two, and they remain stable from year two to year three. And, um, we, it was a similar pattern, but the, with the lower uh, performance in the placebo group. So when we look at memory and executive function separately, we pull those apart uh, for the multivitamin. Uh, we see similar uh, patterns here. So the pattern here, memory is looking um, much more like the global composite, uh, significantly different. Those groups do separate. And same for the executive function, those, those groups do separate and we're seeing maybe some, some uh, shift toward a decline in executive function for people who are uh, taking the placebo. So in our subgroup analyses, I uh, have some listed here uh, by, this is, the, this is our uh, a priori uh, groups that we wanted to examine. And of all of these, uh, the only one that was significant was this uh, by cardiovascular disease history. Um, and so this is self by self-report at baseline. And those that um, uh, without self-reported cardiovascular disease respond differently uh, to those, compared to those with self-reported cardiovascular disease history at baseline. I'll show you what that looks like. So first of all, let's look over here in the blue box at the top and you know what do we mean by cardiovascular disease history? And so this was a, you know this was a parent trial decision. Um, but uh, so there what the history includes uh, the TIA, um, uh, CHF and cabbage, uh, PT, PTCA and stent. Um, and, and remember the MI and stroke were excluded in the parent trial as well. So those were excluded a priori. And so these are, you know, significant events, um, cardiovascular. Um, and what we're showing you here now, this over here in the left panel, those, these are people who did not report any of these. Um, and you can still see the pattern is there, uh, remains. Um, actually, when we exclude those people who uh, endorsed a history of cardiovascular disease, we just took them out of the equation altogether, we still got a significant difference between these two groups. So it wasn't just being driven by those people with cardiovascular disease. There's something there also um, driving this, this treatment effect of uh, multivitamin, daily multivitamin for three years. We look over here to the right, uh, we see that those who did endorse one of these uh, significant cardiovascular events at baseline, there is a clear separation. Um, and the pattern is a little bit different uh, in that we can see that practice effect from baseline to year one uh, for both groups, and then things change. Uh, for those in the, on the multivitamin, their performance on this global cognition, that's what we're talking about still, continues to climb um, and then uh, is maintained from year two to year three. And I just want to, I think, I don't, you know, this needs to be replicated. We need to look in this more. But what I'm, you know, I'm, what I find promising is that these, you know, it was, it, there's some increase in performance and it uh, rises to the level of those without uh, a reported cardiovascular uh, at, um, disease at baseline. So, you know, we've got practice effects in here too. So, you know, we, we need to understand this more, but I, you know, at first glance, uh, this is for me promising that it could uh, stall cardiovascular disease related um, cognitive impairment. Those on the placebo, um, after this uh, initial bump uh, year one, they have a, a showing of decline on that global cognitive function. Um, and, and kind of 
um, I don't know if it's a decline or return to baseline, but um, I think the other, the only other point I want to raise, and this is probably uh, something well known in this group, is that at baseline, those who are endorsing cardiovascular disease, uh, they are scoring lower than those without cardiovascular disease. And this has been reported uh, over and over. So we were able to see that as well. But I, I just, uh, I like, I think this, this particular finding is, is promising for me, uh, for these individuals um, who are at high risk for cognitive decline due to cardiovascular disease. We saw a similar pattern for the executive function composite as well. So the question we always get asked is, you know, what, what does this mean? What's, it, what's the significance of, you know, how can you estimate what's the clinical significance of what you're finding? I mean, it, it's a small effect. Our, our Z score is a small effect. So, uh, you know, without having done a second, tri another trial, um, you know, the best we can do right now is just to try to model uh, what's the savings of cognitive aging using uh, our data. So what we did is we looked at our the variability of our co global cognitive uh, composite in our cohort. So these are all our participants, our 2,262 participants that ranged in age from 65 to 90. And we saw that their global cognitive function composite scores, they decline with age at a rate of about 0.046 standard deviations per year. And that was, um, and so it, it was that as a starting point, um, if our treatment effect is, is 0.028 standard deviations increase per year, um, the MVM using these data alone, so it's a, you know, it's a, it's a, uh, a limited yardstick that we're using, but using these data, where, you know, our estimate is that our, in our study, our supplementation appears to slow cognitive aging by about 60% or by about 1.8 years. Now, um, you know, a lot more to be uh, uncovered and, and, and examined here, of course. So, you know, the question is what's going on? Um, so one, you know, first we have to look back at the physician's health study too. I mean, how, how are we different? How are our results different? And, you know, I highlighted some of these in the previously, but it's, I think it's worth returning to this. That we, our cohort was very different. Um, we had uh, diversity. Uh, theirs was predominantly white, non-Hispanic, older male physicians, highly educated and well-nourished. Um, they, uh, we had a different schedules of cognitive assessments. Uh, we assessed right immediately after uh, uh, brain immunization. Remember that our, you know, our, our big change was within the first two years and their first assessment was two and a half years after randomization. Uh, our cognitive assessment was definitely more challenging than theirs. Our, uh, we have more uh, intentionally, we made it more challenging. Um, we, we have more bit pieces of information to remember on the memory tasks. We had more executive function tasks. Um, our formulation of the multivitamin was a little bit different. It's still Centrum Silver back then. It was Centrum Silver with us too, but Centrum Silver does adjust uh, from time to time based on the latest knowledge. And so it was a little bit different. Um, we, in Cosmos Mind, the supplement uh, added lutein and lycopene. And our supplement was about a uh, range from 150 to 300% higher for vitamins D and K, uh, 150 for vitamin D and 300% higher or for vitamin K. So, you know, there were some differences. And are these differences enough to account for our different uh, results? Uh, we don't, you know, we don't know. Um, you know, our, our method of recruitment was different as well. So, so another, you know, another uh, avenue that we have to, that we're, we're wanting to explore uh, is, you know, are we, you know, what, what's going on uh, biologically with the, with the supplement? What are, are we restoring some nutrient insufficiency? Um, so, you know, we're, you know, we live in a, in a culture where most people are well-fed, um, they, the nutrients, uh, they have access to, you know, good nutrients. Um, we think that, right. But our, uh, as it is, our, uh, the way that we eat, our decisions that we make on how we eat, um, whether it's processed foods, um, uh, how often we eat, what types of foods we might be living with, uh, nutrient insufficiency, uh, as a, as part of the American culture. 
Um, we also know that a lot of our in older individuals are taking medications and medications have certain, uh, can have uh, impact on uh, absorption of nutrients, essential nutrients, um, and also um, uh, the, uh, at, at the, the comorbidity itself uh, could affect uh, the nutrient uh, utilization and, and absorption. Um, we do know the deficiencies, uh, just, and I'm, we're talking for this conversation, I think I'm just talking suboptimal. Uh, so it's, you know, below what, where we, you know, the optimal range in older adults. We do know that it does, it can increase risk of cognitive decline. Um, and we know that participants with cardiovascular disease, uh, uh, they, there are some, they are at higher risk for nutritional insufficiencies. Um, the micronutrient levels are suboptimal, often suboptimal in patients with cardiovascular disease, uh, for example, DK and thiamine C and selenium, and, and patients with cardiovascular disease may be more susceptible to drug interactions uh, that affect micronutrient levels for reasons I described a moment ago. So our next steps, um, you know, I, we feel like, uh, you know, the score basically is one to one, uh, PHS two, uh, one, Cosmos Mind, one. Uh, and we've got a lot of unanswered questions here. So we feel like we really need another trial uh, before we can make, um, you know, broad public health recommendations about what should be standard of care uh, or standard of use. Um, well, and, well, so, you know, the next steps for us, we've got to have a more diverse population uh, if this is to be generalized to others. Um, it, we need to get into rural areas. We need to get more race, uh, 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 ethnic, ethnic diversity. We need to get more education diversity, uh, socioeconomic status diversity. Uh, we need to uh, really uh, look at the, the potential cardiovascular disease effects. Uh, to see if there, there may be uh, some uh, protection, layer of protection that uh, daily MVM multivitamin can provide to people with cardiovascular disease. Of course, we need biomarkers uh, to see, uh, try to help us understand what's changing and why, why, why might we be getting these effects. Um, as I said, we need to replicate. Um, we need to, you know, there's, there's a lot of room here to uh, harmonize with other large databases uh, with, uh, with in our so administering similar cognitive assessments so that we can uh, do a better job of trying to figure out how, what's different about multivitamin relative to other pharmacologic treatments or lifestyle interventions, for example. And um, I, what I think what I'm most excited about too is um, in a next step, in the, it just gives us an opportunity to really venture into brand new territory in terms of uh, outreach and really engaging with the community to help us uh, get to the people and have the people participate so that uh, we can really make uh, um, you know, uh, more generalizations about the potential uh, 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 public health um, implications for something like this, if in fact we are able to show, uh, uh, replicate and show uh, continued benefit. So um, we are planning a new trial. Um, we, it's, it will be, again, a simple pragmatic two-arm, three-year randomized controlled trial of Centrum Silver, again, versus a matched placebo. Uh, we, we feel like this pr the pragmatic part is very important uh, to make sure we can get into reach uh, people who do not live around a medical center. Um, we have, you know, a whole host of cognitive outcomes that we're going to examine, but also uh, adjudication. To, we're going to identify uh, a mild cognitive impairment AD and look at uh, trajectory uh, of the of, of progress, a progression in those diseases. Um, we've got biomarkers planned, um, both in blood and also in uh, microbiome. And so um, in, our, in our new trial, that's just kind of in the planning stages right now, it'll be kind of, it will focus on 5,000 randomized. Uh, we're going to shoot for 35% a minimum uh, from communities of color. Um, and our uh, age range will be over the age of 60 for Black, African American, Native American, Hispanic, and Latinx. 65 for others, um, and we'll have a placebo run-in, and we'll have try to have very few exclusions, um, and we have uh, identified five sites uh, throughout the United States who have lots of experience uh, working with communities and with diverse communities in particular uh, to engage them in clinical trials. 
So this is what keeps us up at night. Uh, this is what we worry about. Um, the m and mind is just kind of a, a, a placeholder for a new name for the trial. You know, are there ethical considerations? Um, you know, if, you know, right now, if, I, I don't think we do have enough evidence to, you know, recommend this in a broad way. So, uh, you know, the science is not there yet. Um, so I, I think I'm, I'm not so worried about the ethical considerations, but when, when, first, when we first uh, looked at these results, we, we did have ethical concerns that, you know, putting people on placebo for three years, if we thought that there could be benefit, but I think we're, it's too early to have uh, that, those kind of concerns, I think. Um, we're, you know, it's a five-year trial. The, what we're proposing is a five-year trial, and so uh, we're going to have to recruit six thousand to get five thousand because we have a we have to complete a placebo run-in. And if it's a five thousand, a five-month, a five-year uh, study, we've got to get all six thousand recruited uh, within fifteen months. Um, that keeps me up at night. Um, We've got, you know, there's always the incentivizing. Why should I participate in a multivitamin trial when I can go down to Walgreens and get it? Uh, so there's a lot of, um, that worries me. Uh, how we keep people in the study for the same reason. Um, staff burnout. Uh, these are all the issues that all of you who do lots of public uh, health uh, research know about. And then also, you know, that, you know, the question I always worry, is this too simple? Is this too simple of, a, of an intervention? Uh, should we uh, just let it go? Um, but I, I think I'm just, I continue to be excited about a simple intervention uh, that doesn't cost much, that could be accessible and translatable. If it would, if we can show again that it does, it can provide a simple, even small layer of protection against cognitive decline to give people a little bit more time uh, until, um, you know, maybe postpone a, a cognitive decline. And in particular, those with cognitive, uh, with cardiovascular disease that, you know, it's, it's a large proportion of, of the population. I think the latest stats that I heard is 55% of uh, older adults over the age of 55 have some form of cardiovascular disease. Uh, that's a large number, um, and right now, you know, we're, we're kind of at a loss of how to help these folks, um, you know, without, of course, all the other more time-intensive interventions. So I, I, I think, you know, at first, is this too simple to propose another trial? And now I'm feeling I can't afford, we can't afford not to do this trial to try it. So to, to kind of summarize here, I, I, these Cosmos Mind, um, we're providing new evidence that daily uh, multivitamin supplementation for three years may hold benefit uh, for cognition in older women and men. And the effects may be more pronounced for older adults with cardiovascular disease. And I don't know, we don't know at this point whether this is more improvement or more protection from cardiovascular related uh, cognitive decline. And the daily intake of cocoa extract, uh, contrary to what we expected, uh, had no effect on global cognitive function. Uh, we really expected a difference there. And this is really why it was our primary. We, there's so much, uh, there's some very nice uh, science showing that this cocoa flavanols has uh, potent effects on cardiovascular system. Um, and so we really expected to see the, most of the action there and we did not. And, you know, for us, I think we're not there yet, but uh, it may have important public health uh, implications um, given these factors that I mentioned earlier. And so we still got some work to do on prevalence, looking at prevalence prog progression. Uh, I, I kind of doubt uh, we'll see anything in our three-year trial on prevalence and progression since we weeded out folks with dementia at the outset. I really think it's going to take a longer follow-up period for us to see work here. But uh, I think one avenue we're exploring right now is how are those folks who come into the study with mild cognitive impairment, how do they do? And how do they respond relative to people without mild cognitive impairment? So we'll be reporting on that soon. And that's how, that's where I'm going to leave you. So thank you, everyone, I, uh, for your time. And I'm happy to take uh, questions. Thank you so much, Laura. Um, that was really fantastic. I'll just give you a round of applause. Um, so I'll, I'll just manage the question and answer. So if you have any que questions, please raise your hand and I'll just call on you. So the first question is from Ron Ellis. Hi, Laura. <clears throat> I I know of you from Tessa Moreland days and I know Suzanne Craft oh. as well. <laughs> so uh, I had two questions. One is, 
uh, how many, do you have any sense of how many people uh, violated the randomization by going to the drugstore and taking the, the supplements on themselves? We do. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, th those are our rogues. Uh, but yes, we were at about 10%. Um, and so we, we excluded those folks um, from the analyses and it had no effect. I think if we, you know, we, we really, the parent trial, we did too. We worked really hard with them to try to explain why it was important that they stay. And, and so our regular messaging and explaining the importance of science and how we never know a real different, we'll never know the truth unless every, you know, people who commit to this, you know, all this messaging, I, I feel like that really did make a difference because they would uh, constantly say, okay, all right, I'll, I'll just stay on the program. But it was about 10% uh, who did crossover. Based on their own report. Or self-report, or... self-report. Mm -hmm. The blood we looked, so we had 157 participants uh, blood from those that number. And we looked at the blood mostly for um, to make sure that the uh, for adherence reasons. And in our subset, uh, the B vitamin uh, levels all in folate all increased uh, as expected in the group that received the active multivitamin and it did not in the placebo group. But, you know, the 157, it's really hard to, to know really what's going on um, and, and to relate it to any cognitive findings. We, we couldn't do that. Did, did the cognitive outcomes track with any improvement in cardiovascular outcomes? Um, I can't answer that. I don't know. It's something uh, we're, we're, t we're taking notes of what we need to look at next, but I, I don't know if the yardstick was uh, granular enough in the parent trial to track uh, subtle changes in cardiovascular disease status. But it's definitely a good question, Ryan. We should we should look into that. Thanks. So the next question is from Judy. Hi, Laura. Thanks for that fantastic talk. Um, in our field, it's so rare to have a positive trial. So congratulations to you and the team. And I can appreciate your cautious optimism, but I think really what a wonderful job that you completed. And thank you for sharing that with us. So I, my question, I have many, but one thing that I was wondering about analytically is in your positive finding with your MVM group versus placebo, is the MVM group those who had just that plus also the flavanols versus everybody who didn't have MVM, but maybe yeah. had flavanols? Can you help yeah. us understand that study right. design Sorry. with those four Sorry. groups? I yeah, I, I should have I should have uh, explicitly said that um, we did look at the interaction term, and there was absolutely no interaction in response between uh, cocoflavanols and multivitamin. Um, so that was as expected, but I, I failed to say that to now. When we um, when we look at the cocoa uh, flavanol, the, the folks who got the multivitamin plus the cocoflavanol versus the multivitamin and the placebo, there was no added benefit at all of the cocoflavanol over the, uh, when, when in combination with the multivitamin. Does that okay, answer your so question? It, it does. So because there was no interaction, you just collapse those two groups together to say those are the folks that had the multivitamin. Right, and, and a priori, that is always what we plan to do. There was, there's no scientific evidence that there would be any interaction between the multivitamin and cocoflavin. So that in the, in the literature, so we had, we, we, we really, you know, it's interesting that uh, every time we, um, you know, when we're, by the way, we just got this accepted for publication, but going through that process, um, oh my goodness, uh, everyone wanted us to look at each of those four uh, cells separately, you know, as it relate, mm -hmm. each one relate one to the placebo. Um, but I think what the point, I think what I, I like about this design and a pragmatic, it's, it speaks to a pragmatic style um, of, in a two by two factorial where if there is no intended, um, no expected interaction, it's a very efficient way to look at the, inter the effects of two different agents in a single trial. Um, when you have interactions, of course, everything changes. But um, that was really always our intent is to, to get in, uh, to use, uh, be financially efficient, 
uh, staff efficient, uh, participant efficient to look at two different agents within a single trial. And so that's why we love the two by two factorial. Uh, had we had an interaction, things would have gotten more complicated because since that was never our, our ex expectation, but um, really we, we really wanted to, to uh, leverage that two by two factorial uh, to, to get basically 2000 people uh, to, to, to examine in both for the cocoa flavonoids and for the multivitamin. And then is it correct that your placebo group included those who did have cocoa flavanols, but not multivitamin, but that's had right. the multivitamin placebo? Okay, yeah, that's helpful. That's right. So those, those gr groups are collapsed. Okay, yep. thank you. Okay, so the next que question is from Michael Crikey. Hi, Laura, uh, I enjoyed the talk. Um, you uh, addressed my uh, first question already by saying it's just been accepted because my question was that I read about this oh, my, seven, eight months ago on MedPage Today or someplace, and I was kind of looking for it in the literature. And I suspect you must have run into some resistance with the reviewers somewhere, but uh, I'm happy to know uh, it's- uh, Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it, you know, our <laughs> finding was, our, our big finding was a secondary finding. Uh, and so it, we, um, and that, that is what it was. It was our, it was a, it was a secondary analysis. So we did um, run into some issues along the way, but that was uh, presented at the CTAD meeting back in November. And I think that's what hit the media. And then it took, it took us a while to get this, get the paper out. We hadn't even started writing the paper at that time. My, my second question was, you said the score is one to one, but if I heard you correctly in the physician's health study, they didn't start assessments till two and a half years after the beginning with uh, multivitamin supplement, is that correct? That's correct. Since in your data, you showed that after the second year, it pretty much leveled off. You wouldn't expect to see any difference between the groups. That, that's, that's, that's true. Um, I, but you know, that wouldn't, then, then, then let's see if we were to, to uh, extend that to the physician's health study, then there should be some separation, a, even a, a slight separation between the two groups, uh, even at year two. And um, well, you, you start everybody with a baseline, though. So yeah, if everybody in the vitamin true. group had raised their baseline up, just as you showed they did, by two years, everybody was pretty much at their, had their full effect, then you couldn't expect any difference between the treatment and placebo group subsequently. That's true. So, so I, the I would, score's I would, not one-to-one, one, right? No, it's one to zero. One to one. Like okay. <laughs> <laughs> the next question is from Donna. Hi, Laura. Thank you very much for that really interesting talk. Uh, a couple of quick questions. For your next study, or is one of the biomarkers you're measuring, or are you going to be looking at APOE status? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Okay, are there any other biomarkers you could tell us that you're gonna look at or? Well, That's we're doing the, we're doing, you know, I'm an Alzheimer researcher, so we're going to do the standard Alzheimer panel uh, in blood. And this is all blood. We're not asking for CSF. That would really uh, send people in the op opposite direction for wanting to participate in the trial. Uh, yes. So we're going to do all the, the blood, bio, you know, the standard Alzheimer blood biomarkers. We're going to bank blood. So uh, we're going to be banking at USC um, or UCSD. I'm not sure where Rob Brisman works these days, but uh, one of you, uh, He's banking blood, and I, so we're going to have blood bank for uh, up and coming biomarkers uh, in the future. And then we're also going to be having some, uh, we'll have some cardiovascular disease, inflammation markers, and also some dietary nutritional biomarkers as well. But we would, um, if, if we ever get this going, uh, love that we're really going to be looking for others who have great ideas about what biomarkers and be hopefully lots of opportunities for ancillary studies. And um, one, one last question on your study that you presented. So I know you said that you were very careful about telling them, you know, to stay in the group that you're at, not to, you know, go out and buy multivitamins and so on. But what about other, plus, other vitamin supplements or minerals that people were taking all along? Mm -hmm. So people yeah. who have been taking vitamin mm -hmm. D, let's say, not, not a multivitamin, yeah. but by yep. itself. Yep. Yeah, so that, that's a really good question. I could have spent more time on that. So to get into the study, you had to be, first of all, willing to not take a multivitamin. Um, so if you were taking an I vitamin, for example, you would be excluded um, and you, could, you had to have your I vitamin. If you were allowed to take up to three individual nutrients, so you could take your D and your, uh, and your calcium uh, and, and, and still could get in the study. If more than three, we, we, it was just, they were just excluded. 
So, um, and that was, we reinforced that throughout the study that you can take three, but that's it. And, and you know, one of our tactics on messaging is not, we don't know what you're getting. You know, you may be getting a multivitamin, so you don't want to double dose that, that it could be unsafe. And that, and that is a true statement actually. So um, that, that seemed to resonate with folks. Thank you. The next question is from Cheryl. Yeah, hi, Laura. Thank you for that brilliant talk. Um, I join Judy in just, you know, applauding what you all are able to accomplish um, in this space. It's such a difficult um, trials uh, environment. I, um, you, you answered my question already, but I left my hand up to possibly um, generate some conversation with you around, you know, what's happening with the mind diet. Um, mm. The um, Martha Claire Morris and her colleagues um, really trying to evaluate that for, for cognitive decline. And this idea that you put out to us that although people in the US tend to be, I think you said um, well nourished, you know, I would say that they are consuming diets that are calorically rich. But when we look at healthy eating index um, scores, for example, we know that people aren't necessarily well nourished. And what I found um, really insightful from your work is that those increases that Centrum Silver has gone through with regards to DK, lutein, lycopene, those are actually nutrients that reflect where the mind diet in its Mediterranean dietary um, setting actually pumps things up, right? And so I think there's some consistency here in what um, Mary, Mar Martha Claire's team is finding and what your team is finding. And I think you have an edge up with regards to the simplicity and the scalability. So um, I would argue that you embrace the, the simplicity of this because dietary interventions are not easy. Lifestyle interventions in general are not easy. And while I firmly believe there is no silver bullet, no magic pill, no you know, one thing that gets, gets you there, um, this uh, really does seem quite promising. Thank you. That's just what I need to hear. <laughs> but I, um, so the mind diet, uh, that, that is a really uh, interesting uh, analogy there. And I don't think I'd connected the lycopene, lutein, and the K and D, uh, but you're right that the mind diet components does definitely bump that up. Um, I, you know, uh, you know that, that has been one you know, feedback that we've got. Why, why can't you just get folks to eat a healthier meal? Uh, why do they need a multivitamin? Um, so I, I do, I'm, I'm uh, the PI of the large uh, U.S. pointer uh, trial that's the looking at the mind diet with um, Martha Claire Morris is a, uh, was a good friend of mine um, before she died and, and, and then, uh, but also exercise and other things and uh, getting people to eat differently takes a lot of work, uh, a lot, a lot of work and resources and access to, you know, uh, food, uh, healthy foods. And so I, I would never want to do one instead of the other. I would, uh, but it's not, not, you know, the, the mind diet is not for everybody, uh, as you said, for reasons that they can't help. Um, and so I, I am excited about that possibility. I think I, I, I just want to think about what you said a little bit more about uh, is there something else we could do within a trial to, um, you know, look at the dietary, the, the, the diets that folks are consuming. We had talked about doing you know, diet questionnaires to see what the interaction is between what you know, the multivitamin and what they're eating. And maybe those who are eating a you know, caloric, but a low, you know, uh, you know, undernourished, uh, but caloric, maybe these folks are the ones that are benefiting to the greater degree. So I think that's a really good idea, Cheryl, for us to really be serious, take, take that seriously, that interaction between diet and um, the multivitamin use to kind of figure out uh, you know, what, what, what's going to be the recommendation going forward? If you're already eating the mind diet, for example, do you really need the multivitamin? Um, I, you know, if we have enough people, uh, we should be able to answer that question. And another thing that I'd recommend is um, looking at fat soluble versus water soluble vitamin intake, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Because, because this level of sufficiency or insufficiency will vary by that, um, especially given the amount of adipose tissue most Americans carry these days. Yes, and that's also the targeted group for us. Um, uh, it, we want to make sure that we're not just 
uh, enrolling those who would who have free time on their hand and they're already uh, quite healthy to begin with. We want to we want the more the typical American. Uh, so that's that's a really a great idea, Cheryl. I think that um, take that to heart. Thank you, Cheryl. So we have another question from Richard. Thank you, Len. Uh, Laura, wonderful job. And you know, I commend you on a really, really difficult study to, to conduct. Um, this is not my area of expertise, so I hope this question doesn't sound too naive, but I, I have always heard that um, you know, vitamin supplementation is impacted by uh, absorption of those vitamins and how well the, the person is able to get the, those vitamins into their bloodstream and, and yeah. have some effect, which could be affected by the microbiome and could be affected by per, perhaps diet at the time that they're taking the, the vitamins. And I would assume that that effect would have been handled by the randomization in your study, but I'm just wondering sort of going forward with your next study, are you considering some uh, you know, blood markers or some other measures to, that could help you to tease out whether or not the people are actually getting the benefit of the multivitamin. Yes, and that, that's a, a that's a, for me that's related to Cheryl's question as well. Is there, you know, <clears throat> the absorption uh, is a you know it's a degree of freedom uh, that we're we're not measuring, and, and we do need to take that into consideration. Um, we will be taking we will be uh, collecting blood. So it's a pragmatic trial. So how are we going to collect blood? Uh, we are. Um, Using all, we have a, we're going to look higher, we've, we're going to hire phlebotomists to go to people's homes. Uh, they can go to a dock in the box in the neighborhood. They can go to the CVS mini clinic. Uh, there's many different ways that they're going to be able to do that. So we can really uh, get blood for the biorepository. Uh, our goal is to look at some very specific nutrient biomarkers. Well, one of our uh, collaborators is a, a good friend of Martha Claire Morris's, uh, Christy Tangney uh, at Rush. And so she and her team have a lot of uh, great ideas about what nutrients we should be looking at to specifically look at bioavailability of these nutrients and and blood? That's a good question. Thank you. Are there any other questions for Dr. Baker? Well, thank you so much, Laura. And I also want to thank all the neurosciences faculty who joined us today. Um, I'll make sure to, so we have two more talks later this year with uh, two really good speakers who are also presenting on, I think, dementia research. We have Maria Glymour in November and Lisa Barnes in December. So I'll make sure that those are um, when those talks are announced that you also get those announcements. Um, well, thanks everyone for this is a really great grand rounds and thanks again, Laura. We really appreciate you taking the time to present today. Great, it's my pleasure. All right, take care. Bye everybody. Bye. Thanks, Laura. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Laura. Great job. Thank you.